All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the latest installment of OpsCast hosted by Catchpoint. My name is Craig Lowell, and I'll be your moderator today. So today we'll be covering the best monitoring, optimization, and delivery strategies for reaching Chinese end users. Included in the webinar will be an overview of performance hurdles that companies located outside of mainland China face when trying to reach this user base, how to overcome these challenges, and how to monitor the health of your digital architecture from within the country. Your hosts will be Mehdi Doughty, CEO and co-founder of Catchpoint, and Michael Lee, Director of Marketing at Alibaba Cloud. After the formal presentation, both Mehdi and Michael will remain online to answer all of your questions. So if you do have one during the talk, please type it into the questions window on your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion. So with that, Mehdi, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Craig, and thank you, Michael, from Alibaba for doing this uh, with us. Uh, for those who have been following Catchpoint, uh, China has been one of our biggest topic of conversations because a lot of our customers care about China, and they don't care about China just because it's uh, it's uh, it's fashionable. We care about China because it is the biggest user base in the world. Uh, more than the US, India, and Japan combined. And oh, by the way, we're not done yet. Uh, there are still millions of people in China that are still not connected, that are still not online. Uh, the other thing is this is a population that shops online. Uh, these are, uh, there is a growing middle class in China, people that care about uh, the Gucci bags, people that care about the latest iPhone, people that care about enjoying um, some of the um, the latest privileges that people can afford to, to, to buy to show either their status or, or just make their life better. So this is why we talk about China. We talk about it because it is a humongous opportunity. Uh, and But it's not easy. So the internet in China is as complex as the country. Uh, we're talking about a fairly large physical uh, country, uh, number one. Number two is um, the internet in China is, is very much controlled by a few carriers, a few telcos, China Telecom, Unicom, Cernet, uh, China Mobile. These are the big, big carriers in China that, that, that basically provide services to either businesses or end users. The other challenge in China, because the, the way the country is set up politically, oops, excuse me, the way the country is set up uh, geographically slash politically is provinces. So each province sometimes can have only one ISP and then reaching a website or service that is um, located in another province can, can be challenging from a performance and latency and availability perspective. The other thing is obviously the, the big 800 pound, uh, wouldn't use the word gorilla hill, I'll use the word panda. The 800 pound panda, panda is the great firewall of China. And so the Chinese firewall, as a lot of people talk about it, is a way to protect the country from, from content that uh, the, the politics have deemed to be either objectionable or whatever. And this is not to talk about that. Um, other countries are implementing similar technologies and I believe that more and more countries will unfortunately. So the Chinese firewall also is limited in terms of capabilities because there are so many hundreds of millions of people going online. These become choke points more than anything. And so you have to take into consideration the, the Chinese firewall. But so in China, the internet is, is very much uh, controlled by three carriers. That's the lesson to learn. They don't peer with each other. There is no concept of BGP yet. Uh, there is no getting any cast to work in China is <laughs> impossible. Uh, there is the firewall. So these are the major hurdles we're dealing with. But we can deal with them. So one of the one of the biggest challenges when I when I talk about a Chinese strategy with CIOs or chief marketing officers or chief digital officers is okay, China is big and we're going to spend millions of dollars on our Chinese adventure, our Chinese strategy. And then they host their website in Switzerland. It's like okay, obviously that's not <laughs> that's not a great strategy. Um, 
if you're going to be in China, you need to be in China and you need to deploy inside China. You need to work with Chinese companies to do that. Uh, one of the, uh, th there is obviously the, the technology piece, but there is also a business piece. And the business piece is in order for you to, to be legally uh, represented in China is you have to have what is called an ICP uh, license. And uh, my good friend Michael here is going to, to talk a lot about that a little bit later on. So you need to have a strategy, that strategy is not just a nice marketing plan. You need boots on the ground, both from a technology and a business perspective. So this is a, an example of uh, latency uh, and packet loss. Uh, the blue line is coming from China out, uh, and then the green light is quite staying within the US. Uh, both, this is a, a website that we're monitoring, um, shall remain nameless. Uh, but you can see the response time, the latency, just the ping round trip latency and the packet loss. So the packet loss, they have it also in the US, but it's, it's a huge increase. So when things are bad, they just get worse from China. It's a, it's a huge amplifier. That's the thing you need to keep in mind. So monitoring uh, the end user experience can be tricky um, because uh, you need to do it not only from a synthetic perspective, but also a RAM perspective. From a RAM perspective, some of the beacons sometimes get blocked or they don't make it in time. So that's, that's one of the challenge. But f for our customers, one of the things that we've understood many, many years ago is we invested heavily in our presence in China. We have over 55 nodes, uh, points of presence across those three major ISPs or four that I've mentioned, but, only, but also with Alibaba Cloud and other cloud providers because we want to make sure that people understand what it looks like. We also have some last mile nodes inside China so they give you that last mile perspective. And so this is extremely important and Catchpoint is still investing heavily in China. There will be more presence, point of presence over the next few months in China. So I wanted to bring this to bear for you uh, and, and give you examples. So what you're looking at here is this beautiful car. It cost $4.5 million and China is the largest market for luxury cars. Um, this car can reach 100 kilometers an hour in 2.9 seconds. It's a little bit faster than a Tesla, actually. And so this, this beauty costs four and a half million dollars and is so fast, it's not even funny. However, Lamborghini's website loads in about 25 seconds with a very low availability. Um, and this is recent data. This is uh, just some screenshots and uh, what we call film strip. Uh, the bottom of the screen from Shanghai, as you can see, it took about 23 seconds for, for our, our technology to stop looking at the blank screen. That's, that's horrible user experience. Horrible. So why? Oh, sorry, there's a little bit of latency. The reason why their website is so slow is because the biggest mistake people make when they, they introduce a website for the Chinese consumer is they don't sanitize it. They take the US version or the European version or the African version or whatever version they have and they just say, well, whatever works there is going to work in China. So you cannot have a Chinese strategy without thinking about what's going to work in China. Having a website that references companies like Google and Twitter and Facebook might as well not have a website for China because that those are the tags, that's the content that gets blocked by the Chinese firewall. Google is not allowed in, in China. Facebook is not allowed in China. Twitter is not allowed in China. And so you, people make a, make a huge mistake by not sanitizing and having a version for the Chinese consumer from within China, obviously. So that Lamborghini that can go 100 kilometers an hour in 2.5, 2.9 seconds, the time it took for their website to load that car at that speed capabilities 
would have traveled half a mile. That's very impressive. So from an image and a brand perspective, if you're going to be promoting a car that costs that much money, that uh, can go as fast as that, uh, you better make sure that your website follow because that's just an image of your brand. China is the largest market for luxury goods as well. You have uh, whether it's clothes or bags or any any anything that is uh, luxury watches. Um, again, these are hungry consumers, um, consumers that have a lot of disposable income, and so this particular bag costs two point two thousand six hundred dollars. Uh, made by a great brand and that website loaded in about you know 30 24 seconds uh, stopped looking at the blank screen in about five seconds uh, three failed requests as you can see why because of the same problem the same mistakes Facebook Google fonts and these things are the the major issues with websites that don't have a a Chinese content strategy. Another thing that is a killer in China is DNS. So when you have a, a website, let's say www.abc.com, uh, and I'm not even going to make it complex with .cn or .com, but let's just pick an example, Patek Philippe here. This is a comparison of Patek Philippe, the watchmaker, and BMW. Look how fast the DNS resolution is for BMW on the left versus Patek Philippe on the right. The reason why is because BMW chose to have a profound D uh, strategy for China. Their DNS providers are in China. Patek Philippe, on the other hand, their DNS providers are probably in Switzerland or in France. And so when you have a TTL or time to live for your domain of 30 seconds or 15 seconds or sometimes I see 5 seconds, what happens is like users end up going and fetching where is PatekPhilippe.com again. And then if those DNS servers are outside of mainland China, um, you are in trouble. Remember, DNS is a UDP. This is where usually I plug my UDP joke, but you won't get it. It's too bad I can't hear you laugh, hopefully. Uh, but UDP is a there is no retransmission. The packet is gone. It doesn't come back. So make sure that you have a DNS strategy as well. Don't have short TTLs for the sake of having short TTLs. Make sure that you have, you're going to invest into a DNS a provider in China. <clears throat> the other mistake I see, and by the way it happened to us as well at Catchpoint, is Hong Kong is not China. Now politically, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it is, but it's not. Uh, the, ch the firewall still is the barrier between those two countries. So this is actually our command and control systems measured. Uh, we, we eat our own dog food here. And so we, we, our primary command and control for the Chinese node is inside China. The backup is Hong Kong. And what you see there is the response time by hour of the day, uh, just the connect time. So the time it takes to establish the TCP handshake between all of our nodes, those 55 nodes in China, uh, to the command and control system in Beijing that we have versus the one in Hong Kong. Huge difference. So Hong Kong is not China. Japan is not China. Just because something is locally close by from a geographic perspective, that doesn't apply here. It's not like, well, I can serve France out of the UK or Amsterdam. Yeah, that works fine. Not here. That's, this is different. So the top mistakes, uh, Hong Kong is not China, Japan is not China. If one of your providers, like a CDN or somebody else that tells you that, hey, I'm delivering your content from Hong Kong and trust me, it's good, don't trust them. Hong Kong is not China. DNS, make sure you have a good DNS strategy. If you cannot put your DNS servers in China, make sure that your TTLs are set up correctly. There is no need to do a lookup every 30 seconds. The biggest one is obviously make sure you don't have content that will trigger those blockages. No Google, no Facebook, no Twitter, no double click, etc., etc. And even content like the one I have on this page, 
even if you have your domain abc.com and you have something called imagefacebook.jpg, that will trigger the lookup, the, the firewall. The other thing is if you want to have a Chinese presence and you are using a CDN uh, that is a local provider, uh, make sure that the edge, the, the origin, that is going to feed the edge that is inside China is not too far. A mistake I see is, well, the edge servers are in China, it's great, but then the origin server is in New York or in Idaho or in Switzerland. Make sure that the origin is as close as possible to the edge, especially if, if, you're, if you're serving, uh, if, if, the, if the end user always has to go back to origin for some of the pages. Uh, some people don't cache their entire web pages on on the edge, so make sure uh, that uh, you take care of that. One of the tricks that I've learned over time that a lot of companies have implemented to bypass some of these hurdles sometimes, especially with content, is make sure that you SSL your entire site. Okay, uh, SSL uh, for the entire site makes it hard to to snoop in, um, although. You can never say never, but that's something that you should be able to do. So these are the top mistakes that I see over and over again. We've been covering this topic for the last probably five years uh, profoundly, and it hasn't gone away. You know, we talk about HTTP2, and we talk about all these great web optimization techniques sometimes, but we forget the core. If you have a Chinese strategy, if you care about those users, if you you want to protect your brand, you want to increase your revenue, you want to improve your operational excellence for, for, for your infrastructure in China, then have a strategy, have a real strategy for China. All right, thank you very much, Mehdi. Uh, so now we're going to turn things over to Michael Lee from Alibaba Cloud, who will show how you can improve your user experience in China. So Michael, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, Maddie, and uh, thanks for Catchpoint inviting us to join this um, uh, webinar. So uh, I just want to re re reiterate and echo what Maddie said. It is really important to have a strategy, especially IT strategy, to go into China for everything that Maddie just mentioned. Um, before I start, I just want to give, a, in case the audience didn't know who we are and haven't heard about our service, I just want to give a quick overview of who Alibaba Cloud is. So Alibaba Cloud is the uh, cloud computing division for Alibaba Group. So initially, we were just an internal you know, division to enable all our um, e-commerce websites, including Alibaba.com, Tmall.com, and Taobao. But uh, since 2009, we have uh, became um, independent and uh, start selling our solution to other business and enterprises. So since 2009, and, and you know, we're already um, seven years in business, and we are currently we are the number one public cloud uh, company in China, and but we, we are serving the world. So we have 2.3 million customers worldwide, and we provide more than 70 uh, cloud services in different regions. Um, and in terms of our technology, we also um, have benchmarked with a lot of world records, so we we, uh, def we have achieved a few of them. And you probably have read some of our um, recent earning report that you know Alibaba Cloud Business is growing really fast. It's triple digit year over year growth. So just going to set the tone and you know hopefully give you a sense of um, our, our background. And a lot of people, our customer, question that are you just located in China? Well, the answer is certainly no. You know, we are, uh, although we are the uh, leading provider in China, but our um, location is worldwide. Oops, sorry. So this is, um, this map shows you our global infrastructure where we have um, uh, our data centers. We have two data centers in the U.S., uh, but last month we opened four more um, in other regions, um, including Singapore, um, Germany, and there are more to come in, you know, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the next few months. So, um, Mandy just mentioned that it is important to monitor your performance or uh, connectivity, right, for your website. Um, why it is important from a business perspective? 
especially for those companies, if you have a website and you start selling those goods, like luxury goods, if you're an e-commerce site, you should, besides monitoring your performance, I think you should just take a quick look from the, you know, the traffic tool to see how many visitors are visiting you from China, and you get a sense of what is your business opportunity. Now, when we talk about connectivity, there are really two full, like two segments. One is your connection. If you run a website in the U.S., you should there's a, there's a connection between U.S. and China. Basically, you're serving U.S. and a server in China. But then within China, you also need to look into how many data or how many servers you have there, because China is definitely a great country, and you also you need to make sure your speed um, is is fast enough within China region. So this chart just shows you that, you know, we, we actually um, talk to or engage business with a lot of companies that helping them to optimize their performance uh, in these two scenarios. The first scenario is how do we optimize the connection between US and China? I mean, a lot of providers will have, will have similar um, Solution, but in a, in a nutshell, in summary, there are three ways. One is that um, if you use the same provider uh, in both regions, meaning that you, if you use, let's just say, if you pick us as your uh, cloud service provider, you know, you use our US West server and you also use our Beijing server. So what, because we have the same, uh, we we have we have the same control over the two servers. We have our internal optimizing tool. To basically give you a little bit boost to 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 um, improve the speed, uh, the connectivity between two regions. So I think that will be the same for other uh, providers as well. But that doesn't probably won't like give you uh, let's just say 20% increase, right? Um, so the second solution would be um, for us. We have third-party solution that basically have additional nodes between China and U.S. And because they are our our, our um, partners, so we also work with them and integrate their uh, node into our uh, infrastructure. So that can provide you a faster speed compared to option one. Um, but then, you know, most likely there will be additional cost because we are leveraging a third-party solution. Now, the third one is almost like the ultimate solution, but this also is also the most expensive one because it, this is designed for um, large data, you know, if you have a large con uh, consumption of data. So most likely if you transfer a lot of, you know, video streaming and also, you know, uh, image files, we could potentially set up a virtual private line and give you dedicated bandwidth between your server in the U.S. and China, right? So no one can share your bandwidth, it's all yours. So these usually are the three ways that we can address and optimize the speed and, and connectivity between two regions. Now let's talk about but once you you let's just say you reach to the other shore, but how can but but, but how, if within China, like I said, there are ma many major cities. How can you continue to ensure the speed between each region? Um, that basically is depends on your provider how many CDN they have. So for us. You know, we have a very, you know, since we are the largest um, cloud provider in China, we have also the, um, the most number of nodes uh, of our CDN. So we have over 500 nodes distributed across China. And, um, you know, through some tests, we, you know, we effectively shorten our website response to, you know, down to milliseconds. Um, and the good thing is, you know, we work with most of the um, major ISP, so those that Manny mentioned earlier, those are all our existing partners. So I think the message is that if you want to ensure your um, connectivity within China, definitely find one that have a lot of, uh, you know, their CDN network is, is big enough. Um, and here's the, 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 the uh, report that ran by Catchpoint comparing uh, Alibaba Cloud CDN with a major, uh, C, you know, competitor within China, and the blue line is all performance, and you can see its latency is definitely significantly lower. I think it's based due to you know our, our you know extensive um, CDN network and number of nodes. 
So, but I think net net, if you want to ensure to have a seamless experience, um, ultimately you should consider to host your website in China to avoid you know packet loss and to create um, you know to avoid packet loss. Um, but some a few things you should know before you um, set up a website in China. I'm sure it, for those who look into this area, you have heard of a term ICP. So all the websites, if you want to hold a website in China, every company, every website need to obtain either an ICP filing or ICP license. Now there is a difference between the two. So if you are a website that only show information and no e-commerce or uh, business activities, what you normally do is just to file, uh, to do, go through is ICP filing. And the steps and procedures are relatively uh, simpler than obtaining a license. Now, if you are running an e-commerce website, meaning there's a transaction happening on your website, then you have to go through a, uh, then application to obtain a full ICP license. Um, these are mandated by Chinese government, so uh, like I said, almost every website if you want to be sure, you know, if you want to run on, in, in China, then you have to obtain that. And just to echo what Mandy said, you know, Hong Kong is not China. Don't think that you can, you know, go around, cut the corner and set your website in Hong Kong and it will be automatically in China. That, that is not true. You, all the websites in Hong Kong uh, will still be monitor or some some of them will be blocked by the Chinese firewall. So uh, you know we uh, actually have a program because we have a lot of clients that um, uh, they they want to set up or they they actually have have been running operation in China. So we create a program called China Connect and within that you know we provide assistance and guidance to obtain our So I just summarized a few key steps that you need to obtain the ICP license. For example, in the for two, uh, your website information, and then you have to fill out some security form, and then your domain certificate. These are all the government we have to examine. And then again, if you want, if you want to conduct business activities. Then you also have to show your business license and organization, organization code certificate. So there are a lot of information that you need to submit in order to obtain the ICP license. Now we have heard a lot of complaints and oh, and and and, um, and actually get a lot of requests to help to 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 go to uh, help the client to submit the application. I think the, the number one um, roadblock that most companies run into is because this process, everything is in Chinese. There is no English process for for this company. Therefore, you know, the, the, the foreign company always come to us and ask us to see if we can help them get the license. Now I have to be very clear that we cannot help you get the license. We can only help you guide you to, through the process. But luckily we have two um, companies, we have two partners in China that can probably give you like hand-holding service. Now they probably give you like, can help you translate uh, the, some of the key information. They can help you submit the form, things like that. So if anyone interested, you can visit our website, you know, aliyun.com, A-L-I-W-U-N.com, and you check out the China Connect program. And here's a snapshot of all the steps that you need to go through in order to obtain the ICP. And on the website, you, we also guide you to determine whether you need ICP filing versus ICP license. So feel free to check it out. Um, so as a summary, if you're serious about doing business in China and you know take advantage of the uprising consumption uh, consumer uh, buying power, you know, you should definitely have a strategy, just like many said. So I think ultimately you should plan to have a local presence that will resolve a lot of issues. Um, and then you should be prepared to everything, all, all the contracts should be in, in Chinese. And, you know, we mentioned about, you know, having the ICP because you need, you want to have a website. 
um, to meet all the uh, government compliance. Um, and also, uh, not to mention, having a good relationship with government will help you tremendously. And then when I say government, there are different levels. There is a provincial level, and then also there is a state level. So they, you know, because from time to time, they will, the different level of government will have different incentive for the local business. So definitely look into that, and they, through those incentives, they can provide you, you know, local growth. So All right. uh, I will just uh, stop here and probably open for any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. So, um, as he said, uh, we are going to uh, delve into some of the questions that were posed during the talk now. Um, and I'd like to remind anyone else who has a question to enter it into the questions window before we wrap up. So, uh, let's start off with, uh, with one from posed by Sarah, uh, who asks, what's the best resource for assistance with banned URLs and other hosts on my site that will get flagged by the Chinese firewall? Um, so I, can, I think I can take a crack of that. So there, I think the number one reason the you know your website is blocked by a firewall is you 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 running a website without IDP, right? So that's the number one reason. So find I think the resource you get an ICP is like I said, you know you can either find some local agency to help you, or you can simply go to our website, you know, go through the China Connect program, but. I think the other thing you should really look into is what is the what is the other reasons that your 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 website got blocked. Mehdi has mentioned that is it because you have Google, Facebook, those like well-known websites that are being blocked by the China firewall in, in, uh, element in your website, or you have some sensitive keywords that usually flagged by Chinese government from time to time. Um, I mean, there, there's sometimes it's really hard to, to say. You, I guess you just need to uh, maybe have someone familiar with the China business landscape to take a look at your content and make sure there's no sensitive keywords. Sometimes you didn't mean to trigger those keywords, but maybe sometimes it's just the way you say it uh, or the, 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 the way you, you put on a website can trigger the, the, the firewall um, system. Yeah, so Michael, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab here as well. So the first thing you need to do is, um, is instead of being reactionary because you don't want to find out when it's too late, is make sure that you're using a monitoring service. Um, and I'm not trying to sell you on Catchpoint here, but there, there are other providers you can maybe use that have a good presence in China. Uh, just make sure that it's more than one or two nodes in China. But so the key thing is really to be proactive. And how you proactive is by synthetically testing every few minutes uh, or every few hours, depending on your, your needs. Uh, is my website available? Is it reachable? Uh, and is it performing well? Because all those three things can be impacted when, when this uh, firewall thing kicks in. And then through analyzing the waterfalls, you can see why, right? And then you can take corrective measures. But, you know, th there, th there, is, uh, there is also, if you Google the Chinese firewall, there is this great website that I've used myself in the past that basically keeps you updated um, on what's being blocked. Even on Wikipedia, there is some information on the Chinese firewall. But the key thing is monitor, 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 because you want to be proactive. You want to get ahead of the problem. Um, because these things change. Uh, one day, they can block one, one keyword. One day, they can unblock it. And so you want to be, uh, you, you want to keep up. Okay, great. So uh, we also have a couple questions regarding ICP licenses. Uh, so the first one comes from Peter, uh, who asks, is it possible to set to obtain an ICP license without an office in China? I think Michael would probably be the best person to answer that one. Yeah, so again, uh, Hong Kong is not China, and Hong Kong website also uh, faced the problem of firewall. So uh, long story short, um, if you have an office in Hong Kong and not in China, probably it's very difficult to get an ICP license. Um, however, as I mentioned, um, that you know some agency will probably help you to let's just say either partner or borrow 
a uh, a partner with a, a, third, a company in China, and through that company, you may obtain your ICP filing or ICP license. However, this is I wouldn't say this is your your ultimate solution. If you do that, definitely continue monitor your website performance to make sure that you know there is no infer uh, inference to your performance. But uh, uh, legitimately to obtain an ICP license, you need to have a presence and a business address in China. Okay, and um, there's a, a related question coming from Ellie uh, who asks, how long does it usually take to register ICP? Well, uh, it's really hard to say. You, because what we have seen, it can range from weeks to months. And the variation depends on how quick you can gather all those required information and submit it to the authorities in China. And a lot because the, the amount of information to collect is quite substantial, we have seen a lot of companies actually drop the ball in the middle. They kind of like, you know, uh, forget about it or they, they procrastinate. Um, but let's just say from the time you submit everything to the authority, now it's on the authority hand, um, I would say a good estimate would be two months would be a good estimate. Um, sometimes uh, if you, if our, our agency, like our third party partner, would be able to push a little bit just because they have some connection with the local authority, but I, I wouldn't say this, uh, this won't be done in days, it will be done in weeks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we also have a couple questions related uh, as a follow-up to the first one regarding the uh, the banned URLs and other things, uh, uh, as Mehdi put it, to, uh, to sterilize a website. Um, so another one from Ellie who asks, uh, does Google Analytics uh, built onto the website, uh, is that included in the, uh, the things that yes. are going to get flagged? Yes, it is. So anything that is double-click Google, um, that is managed and operated by Google is... Uh, is blocked in China. Okay, and uh, another uh, another question related to that uh, from Ray, uh, and this one is from Medi as well because it's asking about uh, the monitoring. Um, so how do he asks how do we measure the slowness caused by the Great Firewall for user access from China out of the total load time? Sure. Uh, so the that's a very good question, by the way. So. Uh, so let's say that we're talking about measuring a, a web property, whether it's a web application or, or like a CRM solution or a website. Uh, the, the, you, what you will see is the connect time. So the, the TCP connect time is usually what you will, uh, what you will uh, use to measure the impact because uh, if things get blocked or if things are slow through the firewall, that's the first thing that get, takes a hit. So what you need to do in your analytics or in your the monitoring tool is start looking at performance by hour of the day, by day of the week, by minute of the hour, and you trust me, you will see some very interesting patterns and obviously convert that to local Beijing time, for example, and you will see some really interesting patterns like the, I mean, that's what we, we see on our stuff is we see like uh, response time uh, increasing during the peak hours of the Chinese users, uh, so that's when the the, the firewalls get uh, get uh, get loaded, and so um, and again there is a scarcity of resources, right? So that's that's there is scarcity of resources within the country, just between the connectivity uh, inside, and then there is scarcity of resources getting out. And, uh, and then, God forbid, things start getting blocked. I'm sure their their stuff gets busier and busier. So, connect time is the and the only metric you should worry about if you want to understand the impact of the of of the Chinese firewall. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Maddie. Um So uh, here's a uh, another specific question about the uh, the Chinese firewall. Uh, how many minimum hops does it take for each option from the U.S. to China? That really depends. Uh, there is no, it's unfortunately not a clear cut, but uh, uh, so let's say you're not using any of these acceleration services where there is like uh, you, you're 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 riding on some bandwidth the pipe from from Ali Cloud, for example, or whatnot. Uh, to the U.S., you can see anywhere between. Sometimes I've seen 30, 35 hops. Uh, so, so the the number of hops can can vary obviously, but it's very high, and uh, and obviously, 
the more hops you have, it's just like in anything, the more the more points you touch, that those become a risk of for failure, and so you want the shortest route. That's that's what it's all about. That's why any cast is important. It's because it reduces the the number of hops between point A and point Z. So you want you want to focus on uh, on making sure that you're routing. And so, for example, from China. Uh, I've seen people that send traffic all the way back to the east coast of the U.S. Uh, that's that's that can be a mistake. Or I've seen people that their traffic goes from China to California to New York to London and then to Amsterdam. You, you're asking for trouble. Okay, and um, and uh, the. Uh, uh, Person who submitted that question, Kinner, also just specified. Uh, so Michael, the question he he was uh, asking specifically about the Ali Cloud options. Is there a minimum number of hops uh, to get into the country? Uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know personally. I think that um, our engineer will probably can provide a better answer. Um, so I would like to, I would love to, if it's okay, I would love to, you know, connect with this Absolutely. person yes. online and find out. Yeah. Of course, yeah. So um, uh, along those same lines, by the way, uh, before we continue with the questions, uh, there are some uh, vendor-specific questions, uh, some questions about pricing and comparisons to other CDNs uh, that we're going to... Um, we're going to hold off on answering these publicly just to avoid uh, you know, disclosing any, any proprietary information or bad-mouthing any competitors. Um, but we will be reaching out to, uh, to everyone after who submits a question afterwards if, if we don't get to it. Uh, so moving on, um, here's a question from Catherine who asks, can I set up a single data center in China instead of Hong Kong? Um, will that be enough to improve the performance? Uh, let's start with Mehdi on this one. Sure. So actually, uh, yes, it's possible. Uh, f first and foremost, you need to understand where your users are, right? So uh, to be able to answer that question, you need to understand where your users are coming from. Uh, so your analytics, your your ROM tags, etc., can maybe give you that. But in general, uh, speaking to leading experts, uh, both outside of China and inside China, you can get away with with most of the performance issues uh, if you set up a presence in Beijing, for example, right? As long as, as long as you have access to all three major carriers. And again, uh, so that's, that's the caveat. So you can, you, you can basically uh, do okay, do very well in China serving content mostly from Beijing as long as you connect to those three major carriers. Again, that depends on where users are. But for example, that's what we ended up doing for our command and control is setting up a shop in Beijing and, uh, and, and making sure that we're connected to all those three major carriers. Michael might have a different uh, perspective on, on that based on their experience, obviously. No, I think I think one thing that I would love to add to what you said, I agree with what you said, uh, just one thing to add to is I think you need to set an expectation of how much better you you, you right. need to improve, right? Because having a data center definitely helps, but then if if that doesn't meet your need, I think you should just consider the adding the CDN option to that. Yeah. That's actually a very good thing. I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen on the phone, you know, we're talking about web performance, we're talking about strategies and all these things. But at the end of the day, all these things that we are, we, we've been trying to share with you are here to deliver on a positive business outcome. What is it that you want? What is it that we need to achieve as a company, whether I'm Prada or Lamborghini or, or whoever? What is it that we want to achieve? And, and, and by how much do we have to improve and how do we measure it, right? And then that can facilitate the discussion on investment, whether it's like monitoring or CDN or, or data center buildup. But the key thing is, what is it that you want to do in China or anywhere else? Okay, now um, we have a question from uh, Rock, who uh, I think this is a simple yes or no, but uh, he asks, when, when we're talking about transferring data from a U.S. data center into a China data center, uh, the Chinese firewall is basically in between those, that transmission. Is that correct? 
Yes. Okay. Unless unless you do unless you do a private lease lines kind of thing. Okay. And uh, here's I, a question. I, 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 Sorry, I, I, go ahead. Michael, that's correct, right? I mean, that's your understanding as well. Sorry, there was a little bit. Uh, oh, no worries. Yes. Yeah. So the question was actually a really interesting one: is if if you have a a local DC in in China and you're trying to feed it from the origin here in the US or in Europe or wherever it might be. Uh, pushing the data into that data center in China or to that cloud provider in China, you're still going through, you're still going through the firewall. And I said yes, unless you are going through a leased line or private line. And I think that's how it works. But I just wanted your confirmation since you're the expert. Yes, I agree with you. Um, so that that what I, I think I mentioned earlier is to have having a virtual private line. Um, that that's basically what you said, the lease line. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so here's a uh, question specifically for Michael. Um, when uh, you were showing the uh, the map of the different uh, of the uh, different Alibaba uh, locations, um, what, what states do you have the uh, the U.S. centers set up in? Uh, one in California and one in Virginia. So we cover the West Coast and the East Coast. Okay. Got it. All right, now we have a question from uh, Mitchell. Uh, he asks, how much money does it typically cost to get set up in China compared to other international growth opportunities? Uh, this one is interesting because uh, I would say, why don't Michael, you start this one, um, take the first crack, and then Mehdi can offer the perspective of a, uh, a business owner who set up in China himself. Yeah, so this is, honestly, this, there's no clear answer because there's so many variables. So first of all, in terms of, I believe you're asking about the total cost to set up the business, right? So it, you may, you may consider, you need to consider the IT cost, operating cost, you know, staff and everything. And also you need to, we need to know like what kind of scale you want to set up your business to. So it's really hard to estimate without those information, but I would say that in general, um, Setting up setting up a business in China compared to let's say more developed country, your cost is not only uh, money but also time because you there are so many. Just like for example, the ICP process will cost you um, time, and time is money, right? Um, so, so net net, I, I I can give you a clear answer. How much saving or how much more would it be? It really depends on your expectation right. and what kind of operation you run. But typically, you know, IT costs um, and operating, hiring, and also time. Uh, th those are the factors that you need to bake into your your uh, your your strategy. So I'll let Mehdi said from a business owner perspective. Yeah, that's a very very good answer, Michael. I mean, time is is really the key thing, and and hiring the right expert that can help you navigate the maze. Um, is is really the the savior here, but uh, you know we we operate over 562 nodes around the world, so we've had to 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 work a lot in Russia, in in China, in South America, etc. And you know what? Everything is a little bit more complex or less complex, so it's a it's um, it's it's a re very relative uh, question. But if I had to compare, China costed us more in time. Um, but once we got things right, then it was a breeze. And then from a cost perspective, from a pure cost, like, hey, if I if I need to set up a server in China versus one in Russia, one in France, one in the U.S., and one in South America, I'll tell you, uh, South America is the most expensive one. <laughs> the Middle East is expensive. Uh, I was just quoted recently by an ISP, uh, $700 a meg um, in the Middle East because you know they put gold on on the packets, so it gets expensive. Uh, but so China is very competitive, in my opinion, based on my experience. Uh, I think uh, the 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 key players, including Alibaba, etc., are very very competitive, and uh, it's it's it, there is no sticker shock. Uh, the sticker shock is time, but I think the workaround is 
making sure you have the right people that have done this 10 times, 100 times behind you because they can make you avoid uh, the pitfalls. They can, they can avoid the, the common mistakes that end up costing time. Okay, great. Now, um, we have a question from uh, John who uh, brings up something we didn't touch on very much during the presentation. So, is there anything to keep in mind for uh, mobile-specific performance in China that requires special attention? That's, uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So, mobile is, um, is a, it's a very good question as well, by the way. I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is a market where I think mobile first applies very well, like most of the emerging markets. Um, at the end of the day, those mobile users are going through the same carriers that we mentioned. It's China Telecom, China Unicom, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? It's actually the same. It's not like in the U.S. where you have Verizon, but then you have Comcast or you have uh, uh, Orange, and then you're going through somebody else. So here in China, the, the the mobile carriers are also the broadband carriers are also the internet providers at some point, right? So, so th th what you see on the mobile is the same as what you see everywhere else. Uh, but uh, just think about the internet in China, whether it's desktop, mobile, broadband, whatever you want to call it, it's the same. Okay, so we have uh, two more questions. One, uh, actually, perfect one for Mehdi and one for Michael. So we'll go. Uh, we'll go to Michael first. Uh, does the virtual private line provided by companies like Alibaba make it possible to avoid the Great Firewall for servers outside of China? Um, the short answer is yes, but definitely, you know, we can avoid some of the major issue. However, this is not a bulletproof solution. If you if your if your website is blocked by the firewall because of the sensitive content, this is not something the virtual private line can can help you. So but other than that, you know, to uh, let's say be through the uh, pocket loss packet loss issue, uh, the private version, and then especially if you transmit a large amount of data from point to point, like from cross border, that will be the ultimate, um, the, the ultimate solution. But again, I have to say that this is not a bulletproof if you have sensitive content. Okay, great. Um, and now the uh, the last question before we wrap up is for Medi uh, because it's regarding uh, monitoring. So, are there any guidelines uh, for monitoring a, a, a site from China that uh, that foreign companies should follow according to the uh, the government guidelines? You know, so I, I think she's saying the, you know, they provide they provide guidelines you have to follow to get set up. Are there other uh, similar guidelines that you have to follow in order to actually monitor the site once it's up. No, no, there, there are no, uh, there are no guidelines. At least it doesn't apply to us. I mean, we're we're not a Chinese company, so we we don't have to, uh, we don't impose any guidelines. Uh, we we will show you whatever our agents, uh, are local there will 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 see. Uh, so so there are no there there there, there are nothing that uh, guidelines to follow. If if we are monitoring a web page. Um, uh, that contains stuff that is blocked. We'll show it to you, but uh, we don't. Uh, you don't get into trouble for that kind of thing. But from a monitoring strategy, always remember there are two key things: you want to monitor for availability, and you want to monitor for performance. Just make sure you you monitor frequently for availability, and you monitor using real browsers and things like that when it comes to performance. So you can take full account of all the stuff that is loading on your web pages. And obviously you want to be monitoring from within the, the country itself. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. so uh, I believe that's uh, I believe that's it for all the questions. And it's a good time because we're coming right up as uh, on three o'clock. So uh, I once again want to uh, to thank uh, Mehdi and Michael and of course everyone uh, who was in attendance and uh, who submitted questions. Um, so uh, thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very Happy much. Holidays. Bye bye.